Warning. Warning. This show contains mature content. Are you ready to get your mind blown? One angry New York City Puerto Rican decided to start a radio show. Determined to piss the world off by shoving a mirror in front of society's face. He kicked them in the balls. What are you? Who are you? This is the Crotch Shot Radio Show. Crotch Shot Radio Show. This is not a test. This is a broadcast transmission. We're going to stay on the air. And now, and now, the weepy, the weepy. Welcome to the Crowd Shot Radio Show, where we kick the issues in the balls. We're on an active war against bullshit. We do anything and everything to expose bullshit. The ends sometimes justify the means. So if you're angry and want the truth exposed, then strap in and prepare to be shocked. This is Smash Mouth talking. If you can't accept that, then fuck off. I'm your host, Louis B. I takes no bullshits from nobody. I actually expose the bullshit of society and chop it up into nice, easy-to-digest chunks just for you. Today won't be any different. Today is a part two. A two. A two for Friday. A two for... Um, we're going to be talking about the Oregon situation again. Uh, as some of you may know, it uh, abruptly ended uh, earlier last month. And we, I am joined together with the lovely and talented Kyle and Shane. Hi, guys. Hey, what's going on, Louie? I'm all right. Hi, uh, Kyle? Yep, ditto. Uh, you, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, so guys, where you want to start off on this? I mean, it, it came to an end. Uh, one person, at, at least one person, got shot and killed. Um, you know, the the their side, uh, the, the militia side is saying that it, there was some shenanigans going on, that he was murdered, it was an, unjust, it was an, an unrighteous shoot. So uh I mean let let's start from let's start from the beginning. Who wants to go first? Uh, I don't know, Kyle. He, 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 you want to go first? Or you want me to? Well, I, I guess I could pick it up from from this point. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, just just to kind of remind everybody, you know, Shane and I were last mentioning this. I think it was on January fifth, your broadcast that day, yeah. and you know, it's worth mentioning that uh, the gentleman Lavoy Finnicum was alive at the time. Mm. Um, and, and so, <laughs> so this is uh, seems to be what started the events on the evening of February 10th, uh, which is according to the FBI's own flash alert. Uh, quote: At approximately 4:30 p.m. Pacific on Wednesday, February 10th, 2016, one of the occupiers rode an ATV outside the barricades established by the militia at the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. FBI agents attempted to approach the driver, and he returned to the encampment at the refuge at a high rate of speed. At this time, the FBI has moved to contain the remaining occupiers by placing agents at barricades both immediately ahead of and behind the area where the occupiers are camping. Negotiations between the occupiers and the FBI continue. No shots have been fired. Uh, they go on to say, it has never been the FBI's desire to engage these armed occupiers in any way other than through dialogue, and to that end, the FBI has negotiated with patience and restraint in an effort to resolve the situation peacefully. However, we reached a point where it became necessary to take action in a way that best ensured the safety of those on the refuge, the law enforcement officers who are on scene, and the people of Harney County who live and work in the area uh, say, and close quote, that's from Greg Brett Zing, special agent in charge of the FBI in Oregon. 
So that's what kind of kicked off kind of the beginning of the end, as it were. They just, uh, you know, and that's and that's rather funny. I think, Shane, help remind me on this one. Didn't uh, didn't Ammon Bundy try to uh, negotiate with the FBI at one point? Uh, yeah, he yeah, he definitely uh, he definitely did. Let me get that date for you. Um, but yeah, he uh, set up an appointment to meet with uh, the FBI negotiator. And uh, yeah, the FBI negotiator uh, didn't show up and they just had a phone call. Uh, so yeah, uh, not a good situation. So uh, let me let me play devil's advocate here. Um, <clears throat> why should the their the FBI negotiate with them? I mean, they they were called terrorists. Um, a lot of uh, from what I, you know from the Facebook sphere, you know the comments are: Had these guys been black, they would have been wiped out by now. Well, just to kind of reiterate from last time you had us on, there is no reason to believe that the uh, Citizens for Constitutional Freedom, that was the name of the occupiers, that was the name of their group, C4CF for short, there's no reason to believe that the membership of C4CF were uh, so-called terrorists, mainly because they don't fit the legal definition of what constitutes terrorism. Uh, like I said before, uh, I can't find a body anywhere. Oh, wait, there is one body, Lavoie Finicum. And wait, who killed Lavoie Finicum? Oh, wait, that's right. It was the government police who shot him dead, 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 uh, accor at least according to the drone footage uh, that was overhead, which, of course, as uh, people should remember if they're keeping on top of the story, Lavoie Finicum was not killed at the refuge. He was killed uh, basically at the side of the road. But like a dog. But didn't he just have this coming, though? Wasn't he just asking for it, being part of this? The C4CF membership was actually on their way to a neighboring county in order to have a public meeting, uh, which I believe was uh, fairly peaceful. Again, I can't find a victim anywhere, so the only people actually uh, shooting was, was the government police. Yeah, and just just for for the purposes of, of uh, full disclosure, they're on their way to John Day, Oregon, to meet with. I don't remember the sheriff's name, but a sheriff of a different county, and they're going to talk about the Constitution. I think they were going to talk about committees of safety uh, there too, mm -hmm. um, just for transparency. Yeah. So uh, after that flash alert, uh, the four remaining there were there are actually four remaining. Uh, guys at the sit-in, I guess I guess you could say, kind of like uh, environmentalists of, of ages old where they would sit in at a tree. Uh, I guess the four remaining sit-ins were the... Uh, there were there actually names. four remaining... Oops. Were, uh, their names were Sean and Sandy Anderson, uh, Jeff Banta, and David Fry. Now, after hours of negotiating and live-streaming by one Gavin Siam... Uh, they settled on turning themselves in the following morning on February 11th, uh, and it, it was rather interesting. And uh, Shane, I think you remember listening to the the live stream. There was actually two different ones: one on the yep. uh, evening of the uh, February 10th, and the morning of February 11th, uh, which was, I believe, yesterday morning. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, and, and wasn't that interesting too? Where it was Reverend Franklin Graham and Assemblywoman Michelle Fiore who were almost kind of like ambassadors on behalf of the FBI. That, that's true, and it, it's worth mentioning as well that uh, there were other like a, a, other assembly uh, assembly people. I'm not sure if they're all women, uh, but uh, uh, Michelle Fiore wasn't the only one uh, that was kind of uh, trying to act as a liaison uh, to the to the uh, to the I guess not occupiers anymore, but uh, to the arrestees. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of and and. and uh, um, there was there's an interesting point here too, <laughs> and uh, Kyle, um, li listening to that live stream, uh, it was it was it was kind of interesting to see Michelle Fiore kind of po uh, politicking uh, on the on the phone uh, to kind of put on her resume for re-election. Uh, I'm not sure if you noticed that, but oh, very oh, very much so. And not only that, but consider also, you know, Chris Ann Hall was was proselytizing quite a bit, kind of was almost free advertising for those. Uh, alleged lecture she gives about the Constitution, mm -hmm. and, you know, I doubt she's going to tell people about the Ashwander rules, but that's a discussion yeah. for another time. But, but there was a lot of politicking all around. Yeah, what, who, I mean, okay, let me, I just want to ask this question, you know, uh, uh, so that way you guys could dumb it down for, sure. uh, you know, the people that will listen to this. Um, why is Michelle Ferrari um, 
significant? How is she significant? She, she's significant because she was acting as if she was, I guess you could say, a negotiator for the FBI, like a de facto one, mm -hmm. because she was actually on the phone with David Fry and the other, Sean Anderson, for quite a bit of it, and trying to kind of uh, make them feel good about surrendering, I guess would probably be the most fair way to put it, don't you think, Shank? Correct. Yeah, she was she was on Gavin Slam's live stream, and yeah, you could. She was pretty much on the the entire time, and she was actually. And yeah, it's worth mentioning that she was whenever the four um, turned themselves over to the FBI. Uh, both uh, both Graham and uh, Assemblywoman Fiore were both there at the refuge. Um, just because uh, I guess the and I mean rightfully so too. Uh, the the occupiers were afraid of turning themselves into the FBI because uh, the FBI has lied to them so many times so far. Uh, that they didn't know if they would actually up, uh, keep their word, uh, so to speak. Okay, so, yeah. but why Why would, like, why should, the, I mean, why were they treated so well re relatively? I mean, these occupiers, why, why were they treated so well? I wouldn't necessarily I, say they were treated well. They're sitting in a government dungeon right now. Uh, but uh, I guess the, the the negotiator, like obviously the negotiators, uh, appealed to obviously kindness and support. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't say they were treated treated so well, considering they're sitting in a government dungeon. Yeah, and Lavoy Finnegan is dead. He's not a political prisoner. Heck, his name wasn't even on the indictment, which is beyond suspicious. So no, they're not being treated well at all. I mean, I mean, I mean, love them or hate them, the membership of uh, C4CF are political prisoners now. That's uh, there's even court documents and such. Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, and and also one other thing I think is worth mentioning. You know, David Fry was the last man out, um, and he was kind of delaying for quite a bit to put it politely. And the impression I got when I was listening to David Fry talked to both uh, Gavin Siam and I think it was Chris Ann Hall at that point. Who's, Ga was, who's Gavin Siam? Gavin Siam, he was a kind of a gun rights uh, advocate who was at uh, a couple rallies on the uh, West Coast protesting uh, some sort of gun control, whatever and whatnot. Uh, I think it was last year or the year before. And so Gavin Siam was, was doing the live stream, and he was actually talking to David Fry, trying to make him feel good about surrendering. And I think, based off of several statements David Fry made, the impression I got was that David Fry realized he had been betrayed by the Patriot movement, but, uh, but he, I think he also realized it was too late for him, so uh, he kind of realized he was in a tight spot, which is why he was just kind of melting down and it was for me it was kind of heartbreaking because he really was the most hardcore guy that i can that i could tell and it's just it was it was really just a bad bad scene and it would be nice if somebody could actually you know transcribe some of his statements because he was uh he was criticizing the people who were saying things like uh oh you should take this fight to the courts and all this kind of really work inside the system rhetoric so yeah, yeah uh, david fry is a political prisoner now and that's a good point too, because if you um, the the uh, live stream on the tenth, uh, the live stream on the tenth was interesting because it seems like there were two different uh, two different mindsets there. On the tenth, they were very, they were committed on I guess dying, and then on the eleventh in that morning when they're supposed to turn themselves in, uh, Sandy and uh, what, what was uh, the other one? Sean, San, San, Sean yeah, and Sandy husband. Anderson, yeah, yeah, um, and. And Jeff Banta, they just turned themselves in, like, without questioning. Oh, yeah, and they walked out. They, they uh, laid down their guns, and they walked out with an American flag in their hand. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, there was definitely a change in the mindset. And David Fry, seemed, he seemed committed. And uh, he did mention on the live stream, he's like, I didn't agree to turn myself in. They just, they, they just did it. So, yeah, I think he kind of felt like he got kind of bent over the barrel on that one. Oh, and not only that, Shane, but also consider something else, too. Uh, at one point, I don't remember if it was Gavin or Chris Ann Hall, but one of them mentioned about, well, uh, the promises were to us, not to the federal government. But we'll back you all the way, David. Like, it was a complete turnabout. Even I was appalled. I was like, yeah, well, David Fry's now the patsy, and so okay. is everybody else. Okay, I mean, uh, let me let me just throw this out there. A lot of the, a lot of the people that listen to my show don't don't know these people so if you guys could just dumb it down explain you know explain who these people are why they're significant and i mean what what was the what was the turnaround what was the uh 
like what was supposed to happen, what happened, and what happened differently, and why is that bad? Sure. Okay. But just very briefly, once Pete Santilli was arrested earlier, and he was the main source of the live streams of what was going on at at the refuge and in Harney County more generally. Once he was arrested, everybody kind of switched to. Uh, David Fry's live streams, which were coming from inside the refuge. Once his connection got cut off, then everyone kind of me meandered over to Gavin Siam, who was actually not, I don't think he is in Oregon, or maybe he's somewhere else. I'm not sure where he was exactly. I, I, th I think he's in Washington. Oh, okay, well, in, Washington in Washington State. In, Washing in nearby Washington State. And he's like acting like, like, a, like almost like a pro bono negotiator slash you know, tech support guy or something. So there was this kind of this hopping from one live stream to the other uh, that, you know, in, in the attempt of, the, like, from the alternative media to stay on top of this, because the corporate media, you have to keep in mind for a while, Louis, that this actually, uh, the situation at the refuge in the surrounding area actually c came out of the news cycle for about, I think, uh, Shane, I think it was about, about a week or two at least. And then right at, at the conclusion of it, when, you know, David Fry surrendered, all of a sudden, the situation there came back into the news cycle, but just very briefly. Yeah, that's that's true. And it is worth mentioning. So David Fry, the the one, that, the last one that surrendered, uh, and the the one that was posting the videos to the YouTube channel to finish your base. Uh, it's it's worth noting. And Kyle, you you did mention this that the communications were blocked. But he must be some smart ass dude because he was able to get around the government, actually get a phone call out to Gary Siam. And, and I I will say this, and obviously this, there's no way to know now. But um, that live stream on the tenth had like. Oh, how many? It was t over 20,000 people listening. And I think that phone call is, it, it's definitely possible that kept them alive. It's definitely possible. Now, having said that, there was also a more or less a simultaneous event that's worth mentioning here in terms of the overall story. Louis, do you remember Clive and Bundy by any chance? Yes. Okay, he's now officially part of this story. Sit back and relax, or maybe perk yourself up perhaps because oh, right. this is what happened Clive and Bundy flew into Portland to visit the refuge on the 10th he was, he was surrounded by SWAT teams when he landed that evening and was arrested on a rigmarole of charges uh, mainly stemming from the uh, Bundy uh, affair the cattle unrustling in Nevada which of course happened back in uh, 2014 you know, and there was you mean you mean the the crime that he already did his time for that they wanted him to go back to jail for no 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 that's the Hammonds. Oh, that's yeah to, oh. Oh, yeah Clive and Bundy was the Bundy standoff the Hammonds uh, turned themselves and I think it was on January 2nd uh, two different states here yeah. oh, okay yeah, the Hammonds are not the same as the Bundys. What I'm saying is that Cliven Bundy, the old man, the patriarch of the Bundy clan, as it were, uh, he's he's now he's now in jail. Uh, and so basically, any <laughs> it's arguable that any gains the Patriot movement got from from that is uh, kind of in question at this point, to put it politely. But yeah, there were all sorts of charges, and it's funny too. The uh, and Shane, help me out here a little bit, but the charges that uh, the <laughs> the C4CF membership were slapped with, I think, was something of a conspiracy charge, right? Yeah, conspiracy, conspiracy to, uh, to uh, what was it? Conspiracy to impede, impede. government officials uh, yeah, from doing their job, like with the threat of force or something yeah, like that. Ti yeah, Title 18, United States Code, Section 372, I believe. Yeah. Now, they were all slapped with just that one count of that one charge. Clive and Bundy, on the other hand, was slapped with a whole bunch of things. Uh, conspiracy right. to commit an offense against the United States, assault in a federal law enforcement officer, uh, use and carry of a firearm in relation to a crime of violence, <gasps> obstruction of the administration of justice, interference with commerce by extortion, and of course, aiding and abetting. So, uh, we, I just got a message, oh, well, uh, 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 oh, well, not a, yeah, message, screw it, uh, from Eclectic Vibrations, um, he says, some say the Santilli live stream gave the feds intel. 
Well, I, I think it's kind of obvious that for anybody who bothered to look at, I think, it, and Shane, help me out here, I think it was the criminal complaint uh, that, that the lady FBI agent wrote up. Correct, yes, yes. It was the criminal complaint where, like, pretty much all of the evidence, like, for the prosecution, what they were arguing is, there is a conspiracy to impede officers of the United States because Pete Santilli's videos on his YouTube channel. I mean, so just so, so for that particular listener of yours, Louie, uh, he should really check out the criminal complaint against um, the members of C4CF. And, uh, and there's like pictures in the criminal complaint where it's, it's all about, you know, Pete Santilli's video. So, that, I mean, that, that, from what I could gather, that seems to be pretty much the basis of uh, the government's claim that uh, there was a conspiracy. You know, and it's a good conspiracy theory to me, I suppose, if it's a conspiracy theory based off of YouTube videos that Pete Santilli yeah, put up. And that is that is a good point too. And I'm I'm actually making a short link for that page now, so you can give that out to your listeners. Um, but but on this page, all of the documents are there. And when you scroll down, um, it, all of the all of the documents, uh, the initial the initial documents were like for eight people, and then there was one for six. All of the groupy documents are on that main page. And then when they scroll down, they can go to each individual's uh, um, political prisoners uh, political prisoners archive. And what I'd recommend for that listener is definitely take a look at that criminal complaint. I'll get you that short link here in a moment. Moment. But yeah, the, the government's, uh, arg the, I guess the government's, I guess, prosecution is based off of, um, I mean, half over half of those pages are literally like stuff from, from Pete Santilli's live stream. So I don't think that your listeners off base in saying that at all. I really don't. But then there's also the, uh, also the intention of what Santilli was doing, and that was to provide, um, provide alternative media uh, press there. Um, so I guess, it, it, I guess <clears throat> that's, I guess, one downfall to uh um down uh, one downfall to relinquishing privacy i guess if that's a good way to put it yeah and um just to kind of give your listeners an idea louie about just how bad it was what cliven was slapped with which is actually in a lot of ways much more serious than what uh the membership of c4cf got uh, slapped with i would like to briefly read if you don't mind the actual and it's very brief but the uh the laws he's he's accused of violating mm. um Okay, so 18 U.S.C. Section 371 says, quote, If two or more persons conspire either to commit any offense against the United States or to defraud the United States or any agency thereof in any manner or for any purpose, and one or more of such persons do any act to affect the, obliga the object of the conspiracy, each shall be fined under this, under this title or imprisoned not more than five years or both. So that's, that's 371. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Oh, here's another one. Very short. 18 U.S.C. Section 111, Paragraph B. Quote, whoever in the commission of any acts described in subsection A uses a deadly or dangerous weapon uh, or inflicts bodily injury shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. Wow. Yeah. Oh, 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 wait, that's not the end. But wait, there's more, ladies and gentlemen. Damn. I know, that sounds bad, isn't it? This is this is a sham wow. It's a sham wow. Yeah. And, and, uh, and no matter no matter what way you look at it, I mean Cliven Bundy's seventy four years old. I mean you could call it a life sentence or a death sentence, whichever one you prefer, but yeah, he's gonna die in prison. Even with just one of those charges, he'd probably die in prison. Yeah. Yeah, and also something else worth worth pointing out here too. There's another political prisoner by the name of Larry Myers, whom I've written about in the past and, and Gary Hunt really kinda took the, the the front line on for a while in terms of trying to make a habeas corpus work for him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's rather interesting comparing what Larry Myers was was charged and eventually convicted of and comparing that to these current new, newest political prisoners. Uh, for example, uh, Larry Myers and Cliven Bundy both were charged with violating 18 U.S.C. sections 2, uh, 371, and 1503, and then interestingly enough, that, uh, that conspiracy charge against C4CF, the conspiracy to injure officers of the United States or whatever the hell, which is, of course, 18 U.S.C. Section 372. Well, Larry Myers was charged with 372 as well. So what I'm trying to say here is that what's happened to Clive and Bundy and the membership of Citizens for Constitutional Freedom is that those types of charges, Louis, have been used before against American patriots, and the guy is Larry Myers. So this has happened before, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so why is this dangerous? I mean, why should why should regular citizens be afraid of that? They should be very concerned about this because the government is criminalizing the right of free association. Their whole case, so far as best as I can tell, and again, I'm not an attorney. I don't play one on TV. I'm just a common man. Mm -hmm. As best as, as near as I can tell, Louis, the government is criminalizing people for freely associating. Uh, and since the, this is an issue with the federal government, that's First Amendment. Okay. Um, I mean, if I could refer to, I mean, the the the, the first uh, broadcast we, we all did about this situation. I mean, why should we even care about these people when they weren't even wanted uh, you know, they weren't even welcomed in that area by 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 the town. Well, the, I guess you could look at it both ways. Uh, the, the government mentioned multiple times in press releases and in conferences and things and press conferences that it's been a divisive, a divisive issue in town. So there are some people that support the cause. There are a lot of ranchers in that area or a lot of people that used to be ranchers mm -hmm. and uh they they may not they may they may not uh, agree with the action but they support uh the grievances uh then there are, obviously there's those those in burns that didn't like them there at all and wanted them to leave um but I, I guess from from what i've been able to gather it's pretty much been cut right down the middle and it's it's important to keep in mind that the Malhor wildlife refuge is like 30 miles from burns so them being there uh place no threat upon uh upon burns oregon additionally a lot of <clears throat> It could also be argued, and this, yeah, this is actually this is actually in uh, in some of the interviews that the mainstream media did, uh, or local media there, that uh, the the citizens didn't like uh, the armed presence of like FBI agents and law enforcement, all of those folks. Uh, so yeah, there's increased pol uh, police activity in Burns, Oregon. Uh, so I guess that could be taken either way. Uh, there were some that supported the supported the grievance, but didn't necessarily agree with the action. But they were on the side of the C4CF. And then there were those that obviously didn't like what they were doing, and then there were those that didn't like the increased police presence in town. Um, so it's, it's not just a cut-and-dry issue, unfortunately. Yeah, and also consider about how the government police of uh, both governments, both the federal government and, yeah, I guess you could say the Oregonian government, treated Ammon Bundy. So you had... The one uh, you had the one encounter, which was mentioned a moment ago, where the FBI negotiator stood up Ammon Bundy, wouldn't even meet with him. So there's your first problem. And I would say the other one is, and I guess Shane, maybe you can help me out a little bit with this one. But when um, Sheriff David Ward of Harney County met with Ammon and gave and basically offered to like escort them out of the county to like a, like a peaceful exit strategy or something, and then Ammon, if I remember correctly. Ammon asked him, well, are you going to uh, address our, uh, you know, redress of grievance document? And, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think the sheriff told him, no, I'm only here to give you this offer. And, you know, do you want to take me up on it or not? And then Ammon said, no, they shook hands and left. Yeah. The government doesn't care what the grievances were, whether they're worth of any merit or not is, is kind of a separate question altogether. The point here, Louis. The government did not care. The federal government, the county government didn't care why C4CF was conducting the sit-in at the refuge. The fact of the matter was they just wanted to act in a very authoritarian manner and just, you know, you know, uh, you know issue orders. And failing that, they ended up actually killing one of them. That's the problem. The government was just very heavy-handed the entire time. And it's important to mention, too, uh, real quick, that uh, um, I, I think it was Sheriff Ward in one of the uh, press conferences he was discussing. And I'm, just, this is, I'm going to probably butcher this up, but, but the, the intention will be there. But he was saying, like, we, don't, we can't have this in, in Harney County. Uh, we can't have this occupation in Harney County. Uh, they need to do it through the legal process. And I think I mentioned this the first time we were on, Louis, uh, on January 5th. But how, this has been going on for over 100 years. And the only like all that's been done is the legal process. And uh, to give to give uh, the Bundy family just a little bit of credit here, um, they did before, like back in November, they were trying to work with Sheriff Ward. They were trying to um, get this solved legally, and their pleas went unanswered. Uh, so, so yeah, the 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 government was not cooperating with them whatsoever. And that, sh that shouldn't come as a, as a surprise to, to most folks. One more thing to add on to this line of thought too, Louie. There's an old phrase about, I may not agree with what you have to say, but I will defend with my life your right to say it. 
me personally, much like I said last time, I don't particularly agree with the grievances of C4, CF. And subsequently, I don't particularly agree with the tactics of the sit-in and so on and so forth. Having said that, what I also don't agree with is how the government completely mishandled this. And that's, I think, probably the most important lesson of all. The government, the FBI, was not interested in negotiating. They were interested in killing Lavoie Finnegan, which is worth mentioning for the third or fourth time now. And I find it rather interesting that people are look overlooking that uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. You know, people got upset when Trayvon and Martin got killed. People were upset when Freddie Gray got killed. But when Lavoie Finnegan got killed, where was the outrage? Why should there be outrage? Because the government... I think they murdered the man in cold blood. I couldn't find a gun in his hand anywhere. For what, At least not according to drone footage. Yeah, but what 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 would be the what 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 would the government get out of killing this guy, making him a martyr, or or you know, for lack of a better term, they sent a pretty powerful message uh, when they when they did that. Yeah, and I'm sh and and actually when they killed him um, that night uh, at the at the uh, refuge. People were afraid that they were going to get raided by the FBI, and a lot of most of them left. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure if that was necessarily what they intended, but uh, but nonetheless, uh, the death of Finnicum kind of brought the situation down to a screeching halt. Uh, um, yeah. So. Yeah, and next thing, yeah, next thing you know, you have the final four, you know, camping out in some, uh, staying away from the actual established buildings and camping out in some field somewhere. So yeah, once Lavoie Finnegan was killed or murdered, either way you want to put it, uh, the situation of the refuge drastically changed, and then eventually led to, uh, you know, them surrendering themselves, you know, in ones and twos and such. Indeed. And it might be worth a mention, too, that the government doesn't like committees of safety, and uh, they were on the way to that neighboring county uh, to discuss uh, Constitution and committees of safety. Uh, and that's been named so many times. And, I mean, with, with William Wolfe and uh, even the court documents, or the criminal complaint for uh, the C4CF folks, uh, yeah, committees of safety was mentioned a number of times. The government does not like committees of safety. So I guess they might have gotten that out of it, too, maybe deter some patriots from sending up committees of safety. I don't know, but... Uh, but yeah, nonetheless. Yeah, and if and if that does indeed turn out to be true, which I hope it's not for other reasons, and which I'll mention in a moment, Louis. Um, you know, that's 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 kind of rather important. Uh, you know, there have been various people in the alternative media who have been talking about committees of safety, including yours truly, for years. So, if the government's going to go around murdering people for trying to remind folks about American history, that's kind of rather telling. And who knows? Maybe this was the beginning of a precedent. Maybe it was a freak uh, incident. Who knows? But uh, it was it was definitely that ambush on the road that that occurred. And there's nothing peaceful about that. And that is something I mean, think about the precedent that sets in a sense. You know, if anybody goes and they do uh, some sort of, um, you know, form of uh, protesting or whatever, they should expect LRADs to be used. They should expect to have you know, roadblocks and ambushes and check oh Shane help me out here a little bit wasn't there the thing with the uh, the checkpoints that were set up after Lavoie was killed the uh, and there was like layered checkpoints and like everyone had to have their ID searched and all that just yeah. full on police state stuff yep indeed yeah multi-layered checkpoints yeah definitely so I guess I guess the next most important thing to mention, uh, Louis, would be that um, at nine fifteen a.m. on February eleventh, so this would be yesterday morning, uh, Blaine Cooper was arrested. Uh, this was reported by his wife on Facebook, of all places, but. Uh, the government police neither confirmed nor denied that at the time. And it was interesting, too, there were some people, some of the conspiracists on YouTube and, and other places on the Internet that were basically accusing Blaine Cooper of being an informant or being bad somehow because he, he actually skedaddled right when Lavoie was killed. So he was, you know, people were kind of finger-pointing him for a while, but he's arrested now, so does that therefore mean he's not an informant? Uh, people kind of seem to be gone, uh, wanting to have their cake and eat it, too, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I uh, yeah. So if you guys don't mind, I think this one other flash alert from the FBI, I think, is also kind of telling. Uh, Shane, would you mind reading that? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, quote: uh, This morning, the FBI took into custody the four remaining occupiers of the Malahor National Wildlife Refuge without incident and without shots fired. Revlin Franklin Graham and Michelle Fiore were at the checkpoint to meet the occupiers as they left their encampments. 
As we have said since day one, our goal has been to end this illegal occupation peacefully, and we are grateful that we're able to do so today. I want to make it very clear that we'll continue to enforce the law with respect to the refuge and other federal properties. Anyone who chooses to travel to Oregon with the intent of engaging in illegal activities, uh, illegal activity will be arrested. And this part's important. Uh, saying that, I want to reassure those Harney County residents who simply visited the refuge or provided food to the occupiers, we are not looking into those events. Um, so just to pause real quick. So it looks like those folks, the ones that may have just gone there for the day, uh, they seem to be in the clear, that is, if the FBI is telling the truth. Uh, continuing, on, continuing on, quote, we are concerned about those who have criminal violent intent. With this occup well, the, well, the occupation is over, there is still quite a bit of work that needs to happen before the refuge can reopen to the public. I want to run through some of that with you now. The Malhor National Wildlife Refuge remains closed and will remain closed for some number of weeks. During this time, law enforcement will continue to man checkpoints at the edge of the refuge to maintain the security of this crime scene. Most immediately, FBI agents are inspecting and securing the buildings and any other areas of concern on the refuge to ensure that no one else is hiding. This process will take some number of hours. Following that tactical clearing of the refuge, a team of uh, FBI Special Agent Bomb Technicians, detectives with the Oregon State Police Arson and Explosives Unit, and bomb technicians from the Portland Police Bureau and Oregon Air National Guard will methodically work their way through the property to locate and mitigate any explosive-related hazards. This process could take several days. Once the refuge is cleared of any hazards, the FBI's Evidence Response Teams, ERT, will enter to document and collect evidence related to potential crimes committed during the occupation. In addition, FBI forensic examiners from the Northwest Regional Computer Forensics Laboratory will work to recover and process computers and electronic devices. It will likely be several weeks before the evidence teams complete their work on the refuge and will likely be a number of months before the forensic examiners complete their analysis. At the same time, the FBI is deploying experts with its art crime team to work on the refuge. These agents are especially trained in cultural property investigations. They will be responsible for working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Burns Paiute Tribe to identify and document damage to the tribe's artifacts and sacred burial grounds. They will start with an archaeological, or archaeological field assessment to determine any potential violations of the Native American Graves and Repatriation Protection Act, NAGPRA, and the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, ARPA. This work will likely take a number of weeks to complete. As the FBI works through each of these investigative processes, we will consult with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as to how and when we will be able to return control of that refuge to the agency, end quote. So, Kyle, what's important out of that? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, a bunch of stuff. I think, I think the let's, – let's take this kind of one at a time. So you, they notice they have the bomb technicians. So they're trying to kind of introduce an element of, oh, my goodness, there's ordinance there and – I don't know, maybe slap some additional charges on there. Maybe slap some uh, possession of WMDs on there. Remember, that's what happened to the Atari back in 2011 for, for people who remember. So uh, that's I guess that's on the table at this point. Uh, notice also their forensic guys are basically combing over all of the uh, computers and cell phones and whatever. So, again, I guess they're going to follow up those leads to try and further criminalize free association because, you know, if Ammon Bundy, you know, called somebody who's, like, totally not involved, that guy might get an FBI visit for all you know. I mean, if they're combing through all that stuff, that's, that's usual standard police technique, I guess. Um, but there's the interesting one, too, about the art crime team. Art crime team. Wait, was the Mona Lisa, like, vanished or something? Oh, wait, no, that's right. In fact, help me out here, Shane. I believe there was that video that was released a couple days right before Lavoie was killed where he and the other members of C4CF discovered those um, Indian artifacts in the basement or, like, uh, underground, so, like, in a cellar that mm -hmm. were, like, stuffed in a cardboard box, like, recklessly. Yeah, mistreated, yeah. And, and 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 I'm guessing there, yeah. As you mentioned, yeah. When I read that, I was like, okay, so there could even be more charges on these folks. Uh, but but yeah. So like initially, like if there's anything damaged that was caused by like the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Bureau of Land Management, uh, that might be stuck on the occupiers. And that's probably, uh, I mean, uh, these folks are already going to be in there for at least at least six years. And uh, yeah, that'd probably uh, tack on a, a few more at that. Oh yeah, not and not only that, but the real. F <laughs> The, uh, the, the punishment that keeps on punishing, I guess you could say, is, of course, the legal handicap of being a felon. Again, ladies and gentlemen, these are not misdemeanor charges, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, this, this is all felony stuff on, on the table here. 
So that that's kind of uh, you know the federal government will make its displeasure well known, unfortunately. But yeah, notice that Louis, the arch crime team in punishing C4CF or likely to be punishing C4CF for something that C4CF went public about and they were blaming BLM for. So I guess the real question is who's responsible for the uh, artifacts being in a cardboard box? I mean, seriously, think about this. I mean, what's the FBI going to say? Oh, well, uh, C4CF basically put uh, <laughs> put the artifacts from like their proper casings and stuffed them in a cardboard box and then turned on a video camera to frame BLM. Does anybody buy that conspiracy theory? <laughs> or it's also is worth it more likely too that? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Is it, or is it more likely that BLM, that C4CF was telling the truth insofar as BLM was being reckless and shoving a bunch of Indian artifacts into a cardboard box? I think your audience can kind of figure that out. Yeah, just real quick, and yeah, you mentioned the felony, Kyle, and uh, it's worth mentioning with the felony conviction. Uh, it's uh, obviously everyone knows these people like their guns. They all they all went there armed, pe- armed but peacefully, obviously. And uh, yeah, no more legally owning firearms if they're convicted, and I, I imagine they will be. And for people who like voting, that's off the table too. You know, good and. Uh, don't worry about uh, you know the, the truck getting shot up with all the flashbangs and the bullet holes that went through the uh, the truck, and of course they're not releasing the photos of that either. Don't worry about any of that. That was totally peaceful, I guess. And that and that's true too, because you notice in those last in those last uh, those last couple uh, uh, press releases we read or statements, uh, yeah, didn't hear a mention of well, we we uh, were definitely sad that uh, uh, Lavoie Finnegan, uh died uh, or was killed within this thing. There was no mention of him. Just you know, forget him. Yeah, he's he's not important apparently. Screw it. Yeah, yeah, he's six feet under. And uh, Shane, uh, would you mind doing the last statement by the governor? So the governor weighed in on this. Oh boy. Yep. Uh, quote, and this is uh, Governor Kate Brown. Quote, safely off the riff, or actually, yeah, quote, I think the challenge is really moving forward, and for the Harney County residents, this has been very traumatic. The level of harassment and intimidation by folks who are staying in the Burns community has been horrific, and the healing uh, will take a lot of time. I think that is our first mission, is to support the Harney County community as they heal and provide them with the resources and tools that they need to recover. In addition, we'll be working closely with the Burns Peyote tribe. This entire incident has been extremely devastating to them. We'll be working with them, providing them with the support and assistance that they need as well, end quote. <laughs> it's so atrocious any which way you look at it. What the government did here, how the Oregon government... Oh, and by the way, for people who believe in uh, the notion of like state nullification as, pr- as promoted by the Tenth Amendment Center and, and, and Dr. Tom Woods, um, how did that work out in this case? Did, did, did Sheriff David Ward act as a constitutional sheriff, quote-unquote, and, and stop the feds from, you know, hurting the C4CF members and, and stop them from killing Lavoie and, and shooting Ryan and so forth? Did, did the sheriff do that? Oh, wait, that's right. He was, uh, he was kind of, you know, I don't know, sitting, on, sitting in his chair in that uh, barricaded police station, I guess, you know, sitting on his thumbs. Yep. Yep, that is true. That is true. So yeah, no mention of Lavoie Fenicum, and uh, obviously, yeah, they they mentioned that people will be arrested. But yeah, it's worth noting that there have been over twenty arrests, and uh, it's possibly upwards of twenty five. I've seen that number out there. And the last time I counted, it was twenty. But I I think that was before the uh, the last indictment with a uh, with I think uh, seven more folks, and uh, there were two redacted names there. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people arrested in this uh, in this in this debacle. All right, so so uh, where do we want to go next, Kyle? Yeah, um, I think the next thing to mention really would be the uh, <laughs> please send snacks. Um, I, I guess Bert, the real question we kind of have to ask here is, 
when you're looking at this, were, was was this really a success on on behalf of the Patriot Movement? Did Citizens for Constitutional Freedom actually get a win here? Um, and I think the place to start would probably be please send snacks. Um, yeah, Shane, help remind me. I think it was what Blaine Cooper. I think. Uh- Yep, yep. Uh, Blaine Kipper put a call out uh, uh, on New Year's Day, the day before Operation Hammond, Ra- or Hammond Freedom, uh, that rally in, in March uh, uh, there on the, uh, on the 1st and the 2nd. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. And obviously one of the things we have to look at when we're, we're trying to uncover or, or, or discover if this uh, was, was beneficial for the Patreon movement. And one place to look there is the, the perspective of the mainstream and also the alternative media. And the Police and Snacks provides a, 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 an interesting uh, uh, perspective. And uh, this is a uh, uh, it's from a page called The Art of Not Being Governed. So it is a bunch of uh, voluntarists, uh, anarchists, and such. But uh, they ran with the please send snacks thing. And uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, most of, and I will say this safely: most of the voluntarist and anarchist community uh, has uh, not been. Uh, they've been they've been kind of making a joke out of the entire situation. So that's one place to look. That is a, a much smaller group than, than the normal mainstream. But nonetheless, the anarchist uh, voluntarist community uh, reacted uh, to that in a comical manner. So that. Does provide one perspective. Yeah, and and you know, Blaine Cooper, the source of Please Send Snacks, I believe, was when Blaine Cooper issued on Facebook, I think it was on New Year's Day, it was the day before the so-called Operation Hammond Freedom, which was the rally in March that took place in front of the Safeway in Burns there in Harney County. Uh yeah, Blaine Cooper said, you know, hey, can you please uh send us like I think it was like cold weather gear. I think he said something about uh, maybe a tent or two or something, kind of like Occupy Wall Street. And then there was a phrase in there about snacks, like send us snacks. So that's where the phrase please send snacks came from. Um, there was that. Um, let's see. What else was there, Shane? I think there was also a fundraiser <laughs> or two. <laughs> yeah, and, you, and Louis, you'll like this one. You'll like this one. Uh, but yeah, the dildos. Oh, the dildos. <laughs> dildos. Dildos. Yeah, like- Patriot dildos. Yep, yep, yeah. We are saying what you think we're saying. Dildos, yes. I, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> dildos. I mean, this is Crotch Shot Radio, okay? Dildos. <laughs> Just for the listeners, we can't make this up. We're going to prove it in a moment. But for the listeners, please, Patriot dildos. Not a joke. It's funny as hell, but it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that is true. So on on January eleventh, uh, uh, well, yeah. So they uh, so Blaine Keeper put out their request for for uh, supplies, and uh, one thing uh, the the folks that uh, disagreed or were poking fun at this at this situation sent them uh, dildos. And uh, Ritzheimer was uh, went on a video and was like, and people are going to waste their money on this when we're out here fighting for freedom. And uh, all that stuff was on the table. And to end it, he shoved all the stuff off, uh, which is a lot better than uh, what happened in the next circumstance. Uh, <laughs> so, Kyle, any, any, do you want to cover that? or? or? Oh, yes. Uh, when, when Ritzheimer cleared the table. Yeah. Okay, so... On January 11th, a video went up where Ritzheimer was showing the hate mail that they were receiving as as a result, as a direct result of when Blaine Cooper did Please Send Snacks, basically. And there was uh, accoutrements. There was dildos. I think there was like some sort of candy, which was in reference to like eat a bag of dicks, I think. Yeah, it was was dick candy, like dick gummy bears, yeah. (laughs) It was dick gummy, yeah, it was really bad. And Ritzheimer basically said, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clear this off. And he took his right arm and he just... He just moved, uh, he shoved everything off the table and basically said, we're going to get back to doing good work for our country. And then he said something about, please come here and be a patriot. Don't be part of the buffer zone that the three percenters, I mean the three inchers, I mean the three percenters were, uh, were, were doing. He said, be, come here and be a patriot. So that was kind of the first inkling that they were getting dildos as a direct result of please send snacks. But then five days later on January 16th, a video went up on none other than Pete Santilli's own YouTube channel, which has now been delisted. You can't view it anymore. Unless, of course, you see one of the many copies of it. Um, where basically Brandon Curtis, the head honcho, the poobah of the Idaho three inchers, I mean three percenters, I mean three inchers, 
uh, where they were essentially uh, having a, uh, I, was it an auction, a raffle off, Shane? How would you describe that? Yeah, so, yeah, so the... And, in the, a hotel guess... room. This was in a hotel room, <laughs> keep in mind. Yeah, so they had uh, all of the, like, the, the head patriots, I mean, Santilli and Brandon Curtis, and well, was Brooke agrees to there, too? I'm pretty sure she was. There was a oh, bunch yeah. of people, there was yeah. a bunch of people in that, like, cruddy-looking motel room talking about dildos. It was really uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, and they, and they all signed them. Like they, like the dildos were in a package, but regardless, mm. they all signed the dildos, and, and it was funny. Like, you want a dildo signed by Pete Santilli, and it's like, no, I don't, I don't. Thank yeah. you, though. Yeah, I, think I was... mean, I don't think, I don't think the dildos have any resale value. I mean, I mean, it is coming from an asshole. <laughs> 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 that's that's true, but it, it was kind of funny too. But yeah, I, I guess you could say it was it was I guess an appeal to it was an appeal for a donation in like more of a comical manner. And so yeah, they were trying to uh, hey, you give us a donation, tell us which dildo you want, and we'll send it to you. And it's like okay, this is odd. I, mm-hmm. I'm uncomfortable watching this. <laughs> yeah, and that was and Brandon Curtis was the guy. He was the point man for accepting the donation. So. Um, uh, <laughs> Louis, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with like legal defense fund scams and all that. I think that's uh, something that's come up before. Yeah, well, especially on this can, show. Sure. Okay. Spe- well, consider spe- speaking, that- speaking of which, a little side note. Um, I saw that particular gentleman stop by my job. Ooh. Yep. And he turned and literally ran away. Well, was, I'm not surprised. Yep. Well, yeah, well, that's what cowards do, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, in a very similar manner, uh, Brandon Curtis was saying, you know, oh, donate the money to me, to my group, the Hi- Idaho Three Inchers, Three Percenters. Mm. Donate to me, and we'll, we'll, we'll use the money to fund. I think Shane, how do you put it? Uh, we'll use it to fund the Patriot Movement. Uh, yeah, essentially, and it's worth it's worth noting, Idaho Three Inch, well, Three Percenters. Uh, Idaho. This isn't the Oregon three percenters. This is Idaho, so it's not even the same damn state. Yeah, the Idaho tri- three percenters they're, they're, they're are in the Oregon. Do- they want the donations to be funneled through them. So, and, oh, I, I and think you're it, never going to find uh, out. Go yeah, sorry. Yeah, true. And, you know, you're never going to find out. I mean, unless I mean, here's a question, guys: Is Brandon Curtis going to be financially transparent about the proceeds from the dildo fundraisers? Mm. Does anybody really think that? Doubtful. Doubtful, doubtful, doubtful. But it's worth it's worth noting. I mean, there, there's this phrase that goes around quite a bit. Uh, there's no such thing as bad press. That's, <laughs> that goes around quite a bit. And I paused. That was an intentional pause. But I think <laughs> this may be the exception. <laughs> uh, no yeah, shit. That that they should have. Like, what they should have done. I mean, Ritzheimer's was was definitely better. Um, but nonetheless, that's something that should have stayed private. He wasn't. He that, wasn't. That, he, that, that hurt the image of the Patriot movement. I, but I will say this: the only time I'll defend Ritzheimer on anything is at least he wasn't trying to per- personally profit f- from it. He was just kind of upset about it, and it's understandable, right? If you were in Ritzheimer's position, uh, but uh, but Brandon Curtis like, no, give me some moolah to fund the Patriot movement through dildo fundraisers. Again, how? I mean, look, uh, whatever happened to selling candy bars in front of the mall? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and actually, on that same note, mm-hmm. Shane, wasn't there that uh, thing on Twitter called Bundy Rodica? Oh, God, this is fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Come on. This was, this was I mean, bad. this really sounds so stupid. Like, how could, like, why would you take this seriously? Oh, well, if you donate to us, you get a dildo. Like, why the fuck would I want a dildo? <laughs> it's like who who was ordering this? I mean, who who said who said? Oh, I can't wait to get me my uh, limited edition Pete Santilli fucking dildo, which he probably already shoved each and every one up his ass. But it was limited <laughs> edition. Oh, look, this is the five hundred uh, out of one thousand uh, Pete Santilli dildo. It still has a fucking speck of shit that. Uh, <laughs> It's like, well, like, what the fuck? Like, who, who, who was in charge of this? I mean, it, it like, it was, it, it, it was really... Pete Santilli and Brandon Curtis, and uh, not like... only that, but Pete Santilli called the dildos heat seek quote heat seeking moisture missiles oh, end God. quote. See, I actually saw the video, and, mm. and so did a bunch of other people. 
So this happened. This is not a joke. It's, it's funny. It's on your, it's on your, it's on your uh, website too, right? And oh. I encourage people to copy it and repost it and keep doing it until Pete Santilli goes bankrupt. And same for Brandon Curtis. Yeah, I mean, look, I like Pete Santilli actually broadcast on the same network that I broadcast this show. And, and you know, thousands of people still listen to him live. Yes, the dildo well, they, peddler. They don't. They don't listen to him live now because he's in prison. But they listen to uh, to Deborah Swan, yeah, or what, not or Deborah no, Swan. No, 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 oh, Deb what Jordan. The, what the hell is her name? Deb Jordan. Yeah, wow. Deb Jordan. Mixing things up. Here. Okay, yeah. when 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 did he go to prison, Pete Santilli? Uh, uh, it was. It was. Uh, I think it was. It uh, was the, the same night, time the night of Boy. Finnegan's death. The night of. It was the night of Finnegan's death. death. Yeah, most of the C four C F membership got rounded up uh, that same day. So. Uh, that that's kind of a down point, but yes, he's he's on the inside now. But um, speaking about the dildo fundraiser thing, Shane, what was that thing called? Bundy Rodica on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So that that whole dildo thing, uh, and as as I told you before, like as I told you before, we got to look at perspective or the the I guess the the perspective of those outside the situation looking in. So there's this, uh, uh, this this hashtag that started trending on Twitter. It's called Bundy Rodica, and it, it was I'm um, Kyle. I'm really mad that you showed me this because I I literally spent like an hour an hour and a half reading through these because they were just so damn hilarious. But I'll give you a couple <laughs> examples, Lou, and you'll you'll really appreciate this. Uh, hmm. Quote. Bundy rested his hands on his belt, framing crotch. Government ain't the only thing that's big around here. And right. so that's the first one. Quote, atop a bluff, Ammon undid his trousers to relieve himself. From behind came Jed. Let me hold it. Your hands are cold. <laughs> so basically, Louis, the background on this was that there were people on Twitter who would do like one or two sentence, you know, erotica, as you will, using the the, the character. I guess you could say a, char- a fictional characterization of the people at the refuge, mm-hmm. and it became known as Bundy erotica, which like, of course this, I guess was this more gay porn. This, th- this thing seems to have, like, a- a- I mean, a- and this is why I think I said this in the last time. Th- this really seems like this was a staged event because i mean you got you got pizza until you got you know the, the, the this is some stupid shit I, I mean let me just say dildos yes dildos. yes it happened. keep keep in, keep keep in mind keep in mind louis <clears throat> I mean, Kyle mentioned that that Patriot, the Patriots have been arrested for the same shit before. Um, I'm not saying I'm not saying mm-hmm. they're like uh, they they went there with a purpose and, and they 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 actually went out and did something. So I guess I'll definitely give credit where credits due. But um, that was a self inflicted wound. When they released that dildo video, um, they 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 assumed responsibility for the for the. Like uh, honestly, you know what? Happened. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I might as well start my own fucking fundraising. Hey, I'm gonna be selling <laughs> some fucking pocket pussies. The like crutch shot signed, radio signed by Louis B. <laughs> signed by Lou. Signed by me. It'll be limited edition. Jim Mint. Jim Mint Ten. Freaking! I'll sell them on QVC, <laughs> so that way everyone can like you know you get them. You know all proceeds go. To keep me off the streets, literally. <laughs> it's about that bad. But yeah. actually, on a, on a kind of a arguably equal comedic note, or maybe slightly more serious, depending how you look at it, remember the sovereign citizens, you know, the guys who believe in a corporate United States and straw men and persons and for some reason keep going to jail because they file liens on judges and such? Mm. Well... They too were involved. So, if you remember last time you had us on, Louis, we mentioned the uh, the statement by Shauna Cox, who's one of the C four C F membership, mm-hmm. uh, the redress of grievance document, where it was notice to principal is notice to agent, notice to agent is notice to principal. Well, apparently there are fake judges that got in on this action since you last had us on. Let's see. One of them was the name of Gary Darby. He actually contacted, and this interview is up on YouTube, Gary Darby contacted, and help me out, Shane, I think it was like some portion of the U.S. military, I think it was. Um, He tried to get the military to go to Burns and, and Harney County more generally, and I think he was trying to get them to shoot the FBI or at least have a standoff of another flavor. Uh, I, maybe it was the National Guard, or I think it was the Army Provost Marshal, I think it was. And uh, that's very interesting, because that sparked off a kind of a video flame war between Professor Doom and Monograph, which which is kind of odd. You don't think about those two guys infighting at all, but they got very 
got kind of heated in, a, in an exchange of video responses back and forth because Professor Doom, apparently he likes the whole sovereign citizenship thing, is promoting it and such, and Monograph is kind of rightfully putting him in his place, saying, hey, don't believe this corporate United States stuff. It's like not true or whatever, for the most part. And, you know, it's interesting, Louie, you know, I wrote an article, a white paper a while back that was entitled, Only on Paper, The Pathetic Story of Commercial Redemption, Freeman on the Land, Sovereign Citizens, Lawful Rebellion, and Community Immunity. So I'm actually very familiar with sovereign citizen ideology and how fake it all is. Um, and so it's very interesting them trying to infiltrate and kind of uh, – co-opt really what C4CF was doing as well as what other people were doing at the time too. Actually, and Gary Darby wasn't the only fake judge. There was another gentleman by the name of Bruce Doucette. Now Bruce Doucette, oh this guy's fun. He was trying to file notices to various government officials like the Harney County Sheriff, uh, the Provost Marshal I think again, as well as like the Speaker of the House. Now, this guy is a con man something fierce, and if he wants to sue me for defamation, libel, and slander, he's welcome to, but I don't think he'll win because what I'm going to say is the truth. Bruce Doucette conned the people last year in Costilla County, Colorado, as part of the fiasco that was known as Operation Patriot Rally Point, and there's a, uh, there's a vlogger by the name of Alex Ansari who actually broke that story last year about what happened in Costilla County where the, I believe it was a, the racist Hispanic government was kicking Caucasian people off of land that they owned free and cleared. It was actually a demonizing homesteaders. But, you know, hey, don't, patriots don't need to worry about what happened in Costilla County last year. They only need to worry what's happening in Harney County because the news cycle said so. And don't worry about Bruce Doucette being a fake judge and conning people. Don't worry about how Roger Marsh, who is his accomplice, uh, himself got arrested. Oh, no, we should just bend over and accept this sovereign citizen infiltration of the patriot movement with fake judges like Gary Darby, Bruce Doucette, uh, trying to con people and get them in trouble. Yeah, it's worth mentioning because you know, you mentioned uh, Professor Doom and Monograph. I guess the, the disagreement between them. Uh, it's 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 also important to look at how uh, the situation there uh, at the Malhor Wildlife Refuge has even been divi divisive between uh, like within the Patriot movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the the occupiers there, and then like uh, groups like. Uh, uh, the Oath Keepers and the Idaho Three Percenters and things like that. Uh, I mean, there are some patriots that are well, patriots that are pissed off at patriot organizations. Uh, so this has been like even to kind of I guess just keep piling on the evidence. Uh, it's uh, it's been div divisive between uh, within the patriot movement and and uh, that's <laughs> uh, I guess another another point uh, that lead that points to uh, not a success but rather a failure. Yeah, right. Um, we're, we're almost down to like the final 30 minutes uh, to go uh, with this broadcast. Like, what what should what should people take away from this? Like, why should they even care that this even happened? Why they why should like, let, let's go. Uh, let me let me do fire off some questions. Why should they care about this? Like, uh, why should the common person who, let's say, is like w watches uh survivor or whatever american I idol i d l e um like even give a crap like like the fluoridated masses if you will well if we're going to kind of skip to the conclusion i suppose i there's a lot of takeaways i think first mm -hmm. of all is that there is very much a lackadaisical security culture the C4CF membership were very lazy about, you know, keeping things that should have been a secret a secret and so forth. And uh, so that when the FBI came in and they were, you know, criminalizing people for their for exercising their right of free association, all they had to do was kind of go hop, skip, and a jump and, you know, just demonize everybody. And not only demonize, but criminalize everybody, throw, you know, quite literally slap the handcuffs on and throw them in the paddy wagon. So I would say that's the first thing is the criminalization of free association. Even if you disagree with someone's grievances, that doesn't keep you safe. That doesn't keep you out of jail. That's thing number one. Um, I'd say thing number two is look at, I think it's kind of obvious, government is bad. Uh, government is bad. Uh, the constitutional sheriffs are bullshit. 
And I think uh, there was actually a gentleman by the name of Chris Bryles. Uh, very interesting guy, by the way. He was actually a fire chief in Hardy County. And he commented about David Ward, who was the sheriff, uh, basically being kind of a, well, quite be quite honest, since this is crotch shot radio, a limp dick. Mm-hmm. That's more what more or less what Chris Bryles was saying. And Chris Bryles is also in a position to know, too, because uh, he was the fire chief, and David Ward treated him quite badly, was very condescending, say that, saying th- statements along the lines of, uh, at least according to Chris Bryles, that uh, old men are no threat, uh, they're, no, they're not a danger or whatever, they can't do anything, just go home and be an old man. And Chris Bryles quit his job as, as being a government employee, and instead he went and joined the Hardy County Committee of Safety. That, I think, speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. So there is no working within the system. There's no compromises and deals and concessions to be made. If you want freedom, you're going to have to take direct action. Yeah, don't, don't, like, that. that's what, you know, I don't get about this whole Black Lives Matter, mo- like most movements. It, it all, it's all about asking permission to, for, for rights that are God-given. Well, yeah, and also let's let's consider something else too. Uh, Shane, remember uh, the Pacific Patriots Network (PPN)? Yes, yes, I do. Yep, I definitely do. <laughs> remember, there was supposed to be that buffer zone. Remember, Sean Anderson, one of the Final Four, he mentioned about where's our buffer zone. That's true, and there there was an interesting statement by uh, by David Fry as well. Um, and uh, um, the the Pacific Patriots Network actually there are two statements by by David Fry. One. Uh, like maybe a week ago or so, and then there was uh, also he even mentioned uh, just within the just within the past couple of days, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, the Patriots Network were uh, they're, they're the equivalent to what the Oath Keepers did at, at Bundy Ranch. They just turned tail and ran. And uh, as Kyle just said, uh, the Idaho Three Percenters promised a buffer zone, as did the Pacific Patriots Network PPN, but neither of them delivered. And that was pointed out Wednesday evening, the 10th, by Sean Anderson. And David Fry made a couple interesting comments on live stream saying that uh, the uh, PPN was actually was infiltrated by FBI. It was co-opted. It's, it's bullshit because they actually put up a, 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 a press release saying that they spoke with those at the refuge, the remaining four. And David Fry said, we've never spoken to them. Never. That's a complete lie. They're definitely infiltrated. Um, so I think that's another point, too. Uh, and that, I guess that just comes with groups in general, doesn't it, Kyle? Yeah, in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, again, like I said earlier, you know, I, the impression I got from David Fry right right before he surrendered, like in the hour or so leading up to that, I think he kind of realized that he kind of got painted himself into a corner because he trusted these people, these reformists who were going to, you know, work within the system and all that. And, you know, I think there's a term that I think I've only mentioned once before, which I think is going to be called reformism plus. So if reformism is working inside of the system in order to change it from within, uh, the political means of making money, and if direct action is going to be the economic means of making money, of actually exercising your freedom without permission, as it were, I think there's an arguable, not so uh, good middle ground. I think you could call it reformism plus. In other words, reformism plus direct action. You know, notice that Operation Ham and Freedom, the rally on January 2nd, that was was the, the protest and all that. If you think about it, it was a way of, of, to sucker people in to either support or directly participate in the Synod at the Refuge. In fact, uh, Shane, help me out here. I think there was the video, the advertising video with the four guys in it. Yeah, that uh, yeah, that is true. It was uh, Blaine Cooper, uh, Jason Patrick, Joseph O'Shaughnessy, and uh, and uh, John Ritzheimer. And uh, they were they were calling people out to uh, to stand up and, and protest their. Uh, I think it was in Burns. Yeah, it was, yes. right outside, it was right outside the safe. We had there calling people in to to come, come uh, make their voices heard at that protest, and they were not advertising. And obviously, some of them may not have known. Uh, they, they may not have known, uh, but they were not advertising sitting in at the refuge. Uh, it was only in regards to the protest that I just mentioned. And yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Kyle. Well, and also keep speaking about Ritzheimer. Keep in mind it, and Louis, this was mentioned last time. Ritzheimer, he was the guy in the crying video. Uh, kind of implying he was going to go off and die and all that. Well, yeah. there's a video that was released where he's in Arizona hugging his children before he surrendered himself into the police. Now, hold on. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you have the night that Lo- or the day that Lavoy was killed. You know, Blaine Cooper kind of takes off and uh, is kind of on the run for a while, as it were. But Ritzheimer had already left. 
and was already back home in Arizona when Lavoy was killed. And then his wife uh, takes footage, uh, you know, uh, video of him hugging his daughters and saying, I have to go away again for a while, which is right before he uh, surrendered. So there's, there's something I think that can be learned here, which I think is what your question is, Louis, is in terms of this reformism plus, notice how the begging of the state for special favors went unheeded. Mm-hmm. So, like, so like mentioned earlier, on January 7th, Ammon Bundy met with Sheriff Ward for the peaceful escort and... That kind of went completely south. And on January 22nd, Ammon Bunny got stood up by the FBI negotiator. But then, you know, look at the holdouts, too. The final four. You know, Sandra stated, uh, that's Sean's wife, she stated that they were offered a free exit from the refuge, but they never received the call. They kind of, according to her, they became holdouts by accident, and they had just wanted to leave, uh, you know, peacefully without being charged with any crimes. And if you think about it, too, let's look at those live streams from the 10th and, and, and uh, uh, yesterday or whatever on the 11th. The role of, of Michelle Fiore, uh, Chris Ann Hall, and Gavin Siam was to persuade the holdouts to feel good about surrendering to the FBI. He, as Sean even mentioned that if they had walked out there, they would not, the FBI would not peaceably let them go. They'd be arrested. And, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's what happened less than 24 hours later after he said that. So I, I'm sorry. It's just so I, I guess what do we learn from all of this? Mm-hmm. I would say this. Be very wary of people who try to persuade you into doing something uh, reformist working inside the system because they might just try to sucker you into doing something illegal and stupidly so. Mm -hmm. You cannot do reformism plus. If you are going to do direct action, you can only do direct action. And that's where uh, Shane and I have got that uh, the freedom umbrella of direct action that's that's available now for people to actually exercise their freedom without asking for permission, without dealing with constitutional sheriffs, without redressing grievances or petitioning the government for anything. Because look what happened at C4CF. They are now political prisoners because they were practicing reformism plus. They were still begging, even while practicing civil disobedience. Well, they, they were begging the entire. They were begging the entire time. Uh, the the rat before before anyone was arrested, before Franken was shot, they were begging. And then when the, when the last four were at the refuge, they were still begging. They were begging the government. Well, just an obvious. I guess I can I can understand their their sentiments, but yeah, can we just go without getting arrested? Like just please, 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 please. Uh, it was yeah, it was it was all begging. It was all begging. There was no, uh, and and I guess it could be argued on one sense that they did try to take the initiative in, in, in creating the freedom they desired in their own lives, but the initiative the initiative they took required the government to respond. Now, when it comes to direct action, uh, that's not the case. Uh, you take the initiative yourself uh, without subjugating yourself before those who falsely claim themselves to to be our rulers, and you can just do it. You can just do it. Yeah, and and also something just just as more of a historical note, you know, I hate to say this, but it needs to be said. I think it would be more than fair to say that the death of the Patriot movement began with the aftermath of the Chattanooga shootings last year, when the three percenters went down to protect the military recruitment stations from what they perceived to be, uh, you know, potential jihadist attacks. And now it's culminated in this carnival surrounding the uh, the birdcage, people squatting at the birdcage. So the federal government, I think it's more than fair to say, they have achieved a decisive victory. They were able to murder one patriot, injure another, get over 20 people arrested, and despite all of those actions, they still enjoy popular support from the mainline American public throughout, as evidenced in part by the ridicule uh, on Twitter, as was mentioned you know, in terms of Bundy Rodica, for example. And uh, when you look at Clive and Bundy's arrest, as mentioned earlier, that was the cherry on top. And that put this victory solidly on the side of the federal government, more or less rendering the victory at, uh, bu- on the side of the Patriots of uh, Bundy Ranch pretty much moot. And so all of this had, could have been easily avoided. Here's, here's the takeaway. All of this could have easily been avoided if the protest on January 2nd had stayed just a protest. And Kyle, if I could jump in for a moment. Um, so, so the takeaway, this is, and as we've kind of mentioned, the takeaway for your listeners is this. If they're interested in, obviously, the, pe- the people listening to your show know that, that things are, are going south, and, and they've been going south for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they're interested, in, if they want to take the initiative in creating the own freedom they desire in their lives, um, they can do so by direct action. 
going to put out that link so they can find the hundred plus things that they can do uh, far more, exorbitantly more than the uh, the political means that are offered. Uh, they can find that at tinyurl.com forward slash freedom umbrella two. Again, that's tinyurl.com forward slash freedom umbrella two. And with direct action, um, obviously, there, there are a few things on there, like agorism, uh, working in the black and gray markets, things that are illegal but not immoral, um, that could get you uh, tossed in a government dungeon. But a lot of those things on there you can do legally uh, without any, <laughs> without risking what, what these folks at the refuge are, are facing and, and uh, will face uh, in, the, in probably the near future, or as government works pretty slow, so maybe it might be a year or so. Uh, but nonetheless, that, that, there's so many things on that list people can do without threat. Uh, without the uh, threats and, and the fear of being uh, tossed in a in a rape cage, um, so I, I would definitely point your your listeners in that direction and and just have them really consider um, what uh, what they're willing to do for freedom, uh, what they're willing to do to make this make this world better for their children if they have children. Uh, now, if it's risking imprisonment, um, protesting like things done at the refuge that might be within their wheelhouse but for most of your listeners i would assume they'd probably would rather not go to prison uh so i definitely mm-hmm. recommend the freedom umbrella of direct that, action that's a leap shane that's a huge leap i mean some people want to go to jail and, and meet um bubba who like i think bubba gets a bad rap no one knows bubba like you know no one takes the time to get to know bubba what if what if Bubba is you know he he's a seven-day eventist and he just wants to teach you about jesus and not anally rape you. <laughs> well, fair. So yeah. So you might have you might have your benevolent prison mate mm. um, that, that that don't want to stick it in your ass. But I, I think uh, <laughs> it happens quite a bit in prison. So <laughs> does it? Does it really? Okay. Okay. I lied. I'm sorry. It, it's that's that's a lie. No, that never happens in prison. Never. Okay. Never. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you know, it's either one extreme or the other. So, anyways, um. Let, let's let's uh let's close this out. I mean, uh, you know, we got a lot of uh, we covered a lot. Uh, you know, I, you know, don't want to overwhelm people by doing another two hour uh, broadcast. But um, yeah. uh, so Shane, uh, what do you want to promote? Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, my name's Shane. I'm the host of Liberty Under Attack Radio over on uh, the Freedom Phalanx Radio Network. That's fprnradio.com. And uh, um, obviously I, I do a broadcast. And uh, um, we are we're actually doing uh, uh, the Direct Action Series now. So if that, if that interests you, uh, definitely come over and tune in, and we'll be analyzing. We'll be interviewing experts on uh, the various uh, economic means solutions on the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action, uh, which can give you even more information on uh, on the methods and tactics that that, that you uh, um, might choose to utilize, uh, but yeah, the website's uh, libertyunderattack.com, dot com, and uh, I guess that's it. So uh, definitely appreciate you having me on, Louis. No problem. And Kyle. Yeah, well, I mean, my blog is located at thelastbastille dot com. Bastille is spelled B A S T I W L E. Thelastbastille dot com, and I write about. I blog about all sorts of things, ranging from law to economics and other such things. But yeah, just 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 one item from the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action that uh, I actually kind of brought to the table is uh, canceling your voter registration. Uh, it is a legal method to kind of strategically withdraw your support from the government, your consent to be governed, at least to that extent. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know. You know, cancel your voter registration. You can achieve freedom in your own life. You don't have to squat, put yourself at needless risk by squatting at a birdcage. You can just cancel your voter registration. Yeah. Don't feel the burn. <laughs> please, please don't. Please don't. If you do, you probably have herpes or something. That's not yeah. a good thing. Yeah, don't vote for Trump either. Don't vote for any of them. They're all uh, liars and tyrants. Yeah. Especially, uh, I mean, everyone's like, oh my goodness, Rand Paul. I'm like, dude, Rand Paul is a fucking neocon. So, anyways, as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this show. Um, please like, comment, subscribe, share, and uh, tell everyone about uh, the Crouch Out Radio Show. Feel free and subscribe to uh, subscribe to the Crouch Out Radio Show on iTunes, on uh iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Podcasts.com, 
or on on the Spreaker network, feel free. And uh, yeah, so tell your people. And I, I would like to, you know, and as always, from my house to your house, mahalo. And that's the end of my show, donk. <laughs>